<clears throat> so I got a I got a suggestion for a final project uh, from uh, uh, Danila, the gentleman who is videotaping us, and uh, the the suggestion is for a uh, an advanced thermostat for a chest type freezer to convert it into a very efficient refrigerator. Chest type refrigerators are are typically more efficient and freezers are typically even more efficient because they have more insulation usually. And uh, so the details are on Facebook on the EC4760 page. If you want to hear more, talk to me or to Danila. Any questions about Lab 2? Okay, so I suggested in the last lecture that you could that you could take this circuit that I drew I believe that was 10K and this was 10K you could take this circuit which is designed to set the threshold for the comparator to VCC over 2 and replace it with an adaptive threshold that would depend upon the average value of the input waveform and in that case what you could do is to replace this circuit with this where now the square wave coming in is applied here not VCC but the square wave coming in and the time constant here has to be tau has to be much greater than one over the lowest frequency that you want to measure but it can't be too long because you don't want the system to take a long time to adapt when you suddenly change the amplitude. And so I would say how slow matters to a human. 300 milliseconds is certainly fast enough, but let's say that tau has to be, has to be less than a second. So it's got to be greater than 1 over the lowest Maybe I ought to spell Lois so that it's F lowest, and it's got to be less than a second. What's the lowest frequency you have to measure for lab two? Ten? I thought it was 100 hertz. 100 hertz. That's how many radians a second? 628 and change. So the frequency frequency here obviously has to be in radians because tau is in seconds so make sure you convert the frequency to radians 1 over 600 radians is uh, oh I don't know uh, 1.6 milliseconds something like that is that enough? yes Analog compared, yes. Say again. No, you're not. I did it in my demo code. You don't set it. As I said in my last lecture, I use the band gap because I'm lazy. But you have to uh, set it to some other value besides 1.1 volts. Actually, could you set the band gap? Could you use the band gap? Right, the band gap goes to the positive terminal, and you turn that on with the ABG something uh, bit, and so you couldn't then put the positive input here, but what would happen if you instead used the band gap as a reference and put the input waveform to the negative terminal? Would that work? Yeah, sure, it would work. 
So you could do that. You just couldn't do it the way I wrote it before. But if you flip it around, you can. But I specifically said that I turned on the band gap reference in the, in the demo code because I wanted to make a minimum number of connections on the board for, for demonstration. You don't, you, you, you can use it much more, you can use the, the uh, comparator much more generally. If you want to go for this adaptive input, then clearly you can't use the band gap at all. Sorry if I was too forceful there. Maybe I shouldn't jump up and down on the lectern. Mm. How many decibels in attenuation are you, is necessary to reliably get a Now that's an interesting question. How would you calculate that? So what's it going to look like? It's going to look like you're putting in a square wave here. So you have the power spectrum of a square wave coming in. As I said, you, you only have to test. It is sufficient for this lab exercise to test the frequency using the TTL output of the signal generator. So you've got a square wave coming in, 5 volt amplitude. Well the higher frequencies are going to be attenuated more by the RC circuit than the lowest frequencies. So let's just consider the lowest frequency, which is the fundamental of this thing. And ask, how small does it have to be before it approximates the mean? Well, that depends. How accurate do you need? And in fact, I think the first order, it doesn't matter too much because the phase relationship between the input and the threshold will be, will be stable after a transient period as, the, as, the, as we get over the transient period of the RC filter. And so you'll be measuring the same frequency but just offset in time where the transition occurs, I believe. Would somebody like to say that I'm full of it? Because I might be. Mm. <laughs> All right, one point. <laughs> All right, so but I, I think that's right. But you probably ought to think it through. I think that as small as long as this waveform is relatively small compared to the amplitude. You're OK. So uh, 20 dBs, how's that sound? One order of magnitude. One order of magnitude. And also, does that mean, for example, we are like measuring the frequency of maybe the voltage? So we will measure it like every like half second, every one second, like keep measuring right? Every, f every five times a second, every one second. I'd say five times a second is reasonable. Okay. Except, aha, but wait, but wait. At 100 hertz, you have to wait one cycle. No, that's still okay. That's a hundredth of a second. It's still all right. Yeah, five times a second. I hate these voltmeters that only read once a second. Because you have to hold the probe forever, it seems, before you get to move it to the next point. Whereas five times a second is really fast. I did say in the last lecture, though, you don't have to do this. I'm perfectly happy if you use the default configuration that is in the lab write-up and set the VCC and set the 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 node to VCC over two because it is sufficient that you test with a 5 volt square wave. I am perfectly happy for you to use this. There's already enough to do in the lab without fiddling with this time constant. If you want to do it, it's fine. However, I suggest that you write, do this first, get all the code running, and then if you decide you have some spare cycles, start messing with uh, adaptive thresholds.
I had a question about how many states are there for an I.O. pin? Well, it turns out there's four states. The, the state of an I.O. pin is determined by two bits, the DDR X bit and the port X bit. If they're both zero, then the input we're in input high impedance. If the DDRX is set to zero, it is still an input, but if the port dot X bit is high, then a switch is closed internally on that port pin to connect a 10, 100K resistor to VCC. This is referred to as the pull-up resistor. So turning on bit one, turning on, uh, turning on the bit in the port.x bit sets the, uh, the pull-up resistor on. In output mode, the output is either uh, DDRX is obviously one, and if the port is zero, you're outputting a strong zero, a low impedance zero. You should all know the uh, feminine impedance of that now. And if the output is set to one, if the port is set to one, you're then uh, driving a high out, low impedance high out. Do you think the Do you think that this transit this uh, this switch is turned on in the output? driven high mode? Does it matter? No. <clears throat> because you have a you have a transistor with a feminine equivalent impedance of from problem set one? 30, 40, 30, 40. 30, 40 ohms, something like that. In parallel with a hundred K, doesn't matter. 100K doesn't matter. Could be on, could be off. Who cares? <clears throat> As we will see, scanning a keypad becomes very easy because you can turn on an internal pull-up resistor uh, in, on the microcontroller. We'll see that in a little while. Any questions about port pins? I'll put I'll put if you want I'll put floating point and you tried that but using a percent F and you got a question mark. I knew what that question was gonna be. I've seen that before. Yes? There is a GCC compiler flag you have to use. Somewhere down buried in the middle of the description of lab one. I think we're in lab one. Maybe it was last year's lab one. Anyway, someplace in the middle of lab one, I believe there's a description of that flag. If not, then you go to the debugging page and look at the debugging page because that has the full, uh, the full description of what you have to do. It turns out that <clears throat> floating point printing is so hard compared to fixed point printing that it takes about one eighth of the total flash memory if you load the floating point print routines. And so there's an option. The default is don't load them and save the space. If you want to load them, you have to link up a different library in the linker. And the directions for doing that are either in lab one or in the debugging page, which is linked off of lab one. Can be done. You have to do something else and even more twisted to use scan F with a floating point input, but it can be done. <coughs> Takes yet more space. So unlike a machine with 
eight gigabytes of memory, you don't load up every library you can think of unless you need it. Any more questions? So when you pull that pin, like when you close that switch and turn on the fourth resistance, does that mean right? And when the pin is like in the input mode, does that mean like because when it's open, you get like a very high impedance in like input, but when you close that switch, does that because it's kind of parallel, so does that mean it's pulled high? Yeah, it pulled high, and also the equivalent will be around like one hundred k. The equivalent resistance for that. Yes. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> this also suggests that if you set the port condition to zero zero, that and some of you have noticed this in lab one, I think that you can't that if you set the all of the inputs to zero zero, that you can't read a given number at the input reliably, that you'll get random numbers generated unless you ground all of the pins or drive all the pins yourself. And the reason is the impedance is so high that the port capacitance holds a voltage on it, which is essentially a random voltage between 0 and 5 volts. And you can prove this to yourself. Take a port, read, read the pin input. Don't, don't, don't drive any of the pins. Just leave all the pins open. Read the port, read the pin input, and then I'll put it directly to LEDs. And then watch what happens as you touch the port pins. And the LEDs will just flash on and off, depending on whether your finger happens to hit VCC or ground. And your, your, your finger has much higher conductance than the, than the input impedance of the, the, of the uh, port pins. And so you drive the inputs with your finger. But any input will drive it. You've got coupling from the lights. You've got the last time you wiped your hand across the table and put, left a residual charge on the table. You've got where your long hair is hitting the collar of your polyester shirt, generating some large voltage. You move your hand to the port, it changes the state of the port pins. Yeah, also, when we do the initialize, for example, we set port B also to the input, but does not specify the port, like where the pin. No, I mean, by default, by default, if you don't specify this, it drops to zero. Okay. All, all ports are set to all I.O. registers, almost all I.O. registers are set to zero by the, by the reset process. A few are set to one, uh, comparator enable, few others. Uh, Transmit ready on the bit, and a few others like that are set to one. Most are set to zero. So I realize that with static electricity, it can affect some of the ports. Do those ports affect other ports? So should I <coughs> set more? Should I set a lot of input ports or uh, ports to output to prevent one that has maybe some static charge there? So, so does one port affect another port? Uh, and the answer is maybe. Uh, yes, it's likely if they're on the same physical set of headers, and it's unlikely if they're on a different set of headers. However, the obsessive programmer will never leave an unconnected pin in this mode. You will always, if you want to be an input, that's fine. But set the pull-up resistor on. That gives it a known state. Don't set them to outputs, because if you set up all the ports to outputs, first of all, it takes more power. Secondly, if you short any of the outputs, they're history. So leave them. The default should be, for careful programming, is to set them to an input with the pull-up resistor on. That will eliminate static effects. It will eliminate noise. It will allow you to read the port in a coherent fashion. 
Somebody uh, mentioned that I was going too fast in the last lecture. They didn't catch something. If I'm going too fast, hold up your hands. Slow me down. Ask me to repeat it. Ask what I just said. But don't, don't let me go on. You know, uh, stop me. I'm happy with that. I'm perfectly all right. Yeah. You probably don't want it all. If let's say that you just that you just went through and grounded all the ports when you built the the board, then you'd probably set them to inputs with the port turned off, because you don't need the pull-up resistor, and it would cause a little extra current to flow, a few tenths of a microamp. But um, but it's not too important. So again, in like lab two, when we measure the resistance, we will have like three branches, each with the like different R to do the output ranging. So does it mean, for example, if we are using the 10K resistors, we should, the corresponding like pin should be set to like uh, pull up resistance on, while the, the other two, we want it to show up as high impedance. So no, you don't want to pull up resistance on. You want to turn on the port. You want to make it a high. You want to set the. You want to set it to on the one. So you're talking about where you have three resistors all connected to the to the input and going to B dot five, B dot B dot six, and B dot seven. Right. One of these pins. And only one is going to be set to output pulled high. The others are going to be set to draw no current. No current. But inputs with high impedance. Inputs with high impedance. In other words, you do not want to turn on the pull up resistor in this case because you don't want any current to flow through these re the resistors that are not turned on. You want a strong one at the output. You want to be able to drive current through the input because, after all, in the input is going to be some test resistor, RT, right, to ground. Yeah. You have no idea what size that resistor is. You better be able to drive it. So you need a strong one. And furthermore, you want to know exactly what you're driving it with. This is, this is 100K plus or minus 30%. This is like plus or minus 30%. You don't want to use this internal resistor for any sort of precision measurement. Therefore, you either have to drive it with a strong one so you know that you're either getting 1K, 10K, or 100K, or you want it completely off so that it's drawing no current at all. Okay, so in realistic way, it's tuned to like output, a PNS output. The port is 0 or 1. It's yeah. always like the pull, the pull up is always off, or that also changes the, like the state for that switch. I mean, for the port, for, for, for the port. I mean, DDI is always one, which means output, right? That's output. Doesn't matter in this case whether the, you don't care whether this bit turns on this resistor or not because it's in parallel with a Thevenin and equivalent of 40 ohms. But then why you mention like it would interfere with the precision? If it's in the input state. Oh, okay. Okay. <coughs> What's the input resistance of the A to D converter? How many people have looked that up on the data sheet? I know one per two people who know because we talked about it just before lecture. Interesting thing to look up. After all, I said you should put a 1K resistor in the input before the A to D. 
Presumably I'm saying that knowing that it's not going to matter, but really you should verify that. Don't take my word for it. What else? I'm still looking over there for the clock. <coughs> Anything else on lab two? All right, well, <clears throat> let's, let's talk a little bit more, more about the ADC then. Oh, yes, I wrote a note to myself up here. Remember, before you put your whiteboards in the, in the project cabinet, you must remove the LCD and the keypad from it. We don't have enough for 50 people, for 50 groups to all use them simultaneously. So if you put them away with the LCDs on, we take them off as gently as possible, consistent with the amount of time we have. <laughs> if there are a lot of them left on, we get less careful. So, how many people are going to use the ADC in 8-bit mode? Okay, how many in 10-bit mode? How many don't have a clue yet because they have oh. <laughs> All right, if you're going to reuse it in 10-bit, in 8-bit mode, You could say, uh, let's say that AN is, a car, is, a, is a, an int. You could just say AN equals ADC high. Assuming that the, I started a MATLAB comment, sorry. Uh, assuming that that you have the ADLAR on. If the AD left adjust is on, then you can just read the high register, ADC high, and get the top eight bits. Ignore the bottom eight bits, you're golden. If you want to do 10 bit mode, then you can set AN equal to AD. C low and then add A D C high times two fifty six plus A N. Remember, you have to read A D C low first. This forces this force is separating, separating the, the computation into two pieces forces the compiler to generate code to read the low register first and then the high register, which you have to do. If you read them in the other order, it locks the ADD, ADC converter. I have a quick question. Is the uh, compiler smart enough to change time to 56 to a rough shift by 8? That seems really it is, oh, is it smart enough, is it smart enough to do a left shift eight? Well, sometimes. <laughs> it depends on the context. So I suggest that you write this as times 256 and go look at the, go look at the assembler and see what came out. L. That forces, that is a typecast that forces 256 to be a long. That forces the multiplication to be more than 8 bits. If ADC high is an 8 bit value and 256 is an 8 bit value, 256 times this 8 bit value will be truncated to 8 bits and you will be bored by the result, <laughs> which will always be zero. Yes? I couldn't hear that last. 
No, you don't have to do that because because the high and the, 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 the high and the low are actually two different registers that you read separately. The, if if the ah if the ADLAR is on, then the top bits are the top eight bits are all here and the bottom two bits are here. So if the ADLAR is on, you don't need to to do anything. You don't need to read this. You don't need to mask or anything. If you're reading all ten bits, and what did I assume here? AD AD. L A R is off here, then, then uh, you don't need to mask the bits. They'll be guaranteed to be set to zero, the ones that are not used. Yes, thank you. So let's, we have a few minutes to set up code here. And. <coughs> <clears throat> you can use the ADC in lots of different ways. I'm going to show you the easiest way of doing it with no interrupts, but, but there are interrupt driven versions that you can use. So, so we're going to include the usual stuff and set up the files for doing standard I.O. and so on. And define a, just a car A in because I'm only going to use eight bits here. And oh, this has got to be an int. Void may uh, void. So what we're going to do. <clears throat> is to set AD mux. First we're going to set AD mux to 1 in the ADLAR. So we're going to set the ADLAR on. Uh, this also does two other things which you can't see. It sets the external reference to it sets a ref to external reference because the top two bits are zero for an external reference, so we're not setting them. So we're setting the top two bits to zero. That means we're using the external reference. And on the STK500, that means that the jumper called a ref must be mounted. Lastly, the other thing we're doing here is we're setting the MUX channel to zero. This is zero binary, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The bottom five digits are the channel. This is ADLAR, and this is the VREF source. Yes, I would in recommend in using the internal AVCC because that way you can just unmount the jumper. By the way, when you unmount the jumper, don't throw it on the tabletop because that'll just annoy the next person who's trying to use the board. But unmount it and push it back on just one of the two pins. And that way it'll stay on the board. <clears throat> but yes, you definitely want to use the internal AVCC because otherwise you couldn't automatically shift between That's references. Right. That's quite right. Then we're going to set the ADSR, uh, let's see, CSRA, ADCSRA, control and status register to enable the A to D converter. That is to say, it actually turns on the power to the A to D converter, because it's pretty power hungry. 
we're going to or that with ADSC, which starts the first conversion. Starting the, setting the AD start conversion bit, start conversion, starts the conversion. And we're going to add 7, which sets the prescaler to 128. Twenty-six cycles. So, if you were to set a den equal to zero again, yes, it would go through the same. It would take twenty-six cycles again. That is correct. So, typically, in a program, you're going to turn on a den and leave it on. All right, so now we're going to go into the usual loop. Now, oh, yes, I should say one other thing. I'm going to f print f. I'm going to f print f some long message here. Blah, blah. And because I used an f print f, and had more than one character in it, we don't fall through the statement for at least one millisecond. Therefore, the conversion is done by the time we get to the next statement. Because a conversion takes 100 microseconds. It's cheesy. Yeah. Say never use delay microsecond or never use delay millisecond. What? Wouldn't it be a good time to use a delay function? Because you're basically doing the same thing that after that. You could do that. In this case, if you use a delay before you get into, in, into the while one, if you, get, if you use a delay during initialization, I'm totally okay with that because that only happens once. In this case, I wanted to, start, I wanted to put out the message starting ADC demo because obsessiveness suggests you should always have a starting message to tell that your code's running. Now we just read ADCH, which we can do because we've spent the time necessary to wait for it to be done. And then as soon as we read it, as soon as we read it, we OR in another one into the ADSC and start the next conversion. For example, if we finish one conversion and we start another one, but before the, the second one finish, we try to access to the ADC edge, for example, where we get the previous conversion result or something else. Like you always read before you start a new conversion. Yes, but I mean, what if, like, for example, you, you don't have that here? If you, you mean, do you read, you read it before it's done? Yes. Yeah. You get garbage. You get nonsense. It doesn't. It doesn't halt. It doesn't wait. You just read nothing. You read. You read random bits. So, if you actually are trying to go as fast as you possibly can, then you would pull the ADSC bit to see if it was zero. If the ADC, if you set it to one, and then you pull it to see if it's zero. If it's zero, it means the conversion is finished. And so you do a while, while ADSC bit one, hang, do a spin weight, and then fall through the while as soon as it's zero. And also would like ISR version of that be better if I want to convert this very quickly? Better? It's not faster. No. <laughs> it's not faster because a, a, a very short while one loop, or a very short while one 
ADSC equals one is going to execute in five cycles, six cycles. It takes uh, 75 cycles to get in and out of an interrupt. Okay. Now, if you need absolutely guaranteed precise timing, then you use the interrupt. Okay. It's slower, but it's going to get you there every time in the same amount of time. Okay. So now we're just going to do a printf percent d backslash n backslash r and and then end and again this takes so long this printf takes so long but by the time we get back to the beginning of this loop adc high is valid again So this is this my code is sloppily or perhaps elegantly depending on how you look at it <laughs> is using the fact that printf is so slow to make sure that the a to d conversion is done Last year I, for the, for the equivalent lab I had people write a video game in which they had to measure a, vo a, a user input 60 times a second. So every time there was a vertical interrupt, every time there was a new frame start, they read the A to D converter. 60 times a second, you know it's done by the time you get back to that point. You don't have to check for the ADSC bit to be zero. If you want to go as fast as possible and not waste cycles, you have to check this bit. <clears throat> I just didn't do it in the demo code. Good question. Since main returns to nowhere, right. uh, it turns out that GCC by default specifies an int on main. And presumably some versions of GCC run in an environment that actually has an operating system. So for compatibility between versions, they made it an int even though if you returned an int from main, who would interpret it? All right, it goes into the ozone, goes into the bit bucket. <clears throat> there are more examples of ADD conversion online in the links in the down in the links section of the of the uh, page. If, however, as you read through the ADD conver uh, ADD conversion data sheet. Some of you are smiling because have you tried to read that? Has anybody tried to read that? Have you read, tried to read that? Is that why you're smiling? It's a homely. <laughs> it is a, a frightening piece of prose. <clears throat> you can read it. It just is. Oh. The only way I know to read it is to read a paragraph and then write some code and see if it works and then read the next paragraph and write some code and see if it works. And when the code works, you know you finally read the paragraph correctly. It's, it's really complicated. More questions on lab two. So again, let me state again that for this lab, you don't have to use the keypad. You can use it. I'll be happy with using the STK500 buttons. There is no particular reason in this lab to have to enter a numeric sequence, 3.14159, enter. In the next lab, in lab three, there will be such a requirement. You will have to enter a parameter followed by a terminator key, like an enter key but there's no enter key on the keypad, so you'll have to make one up. And so if you use a keypad, you've gotten a head start on lab three. If you don't use a keypad, you save a little time on this lab. I think it's a wash. So you can do either way you want. Questions? Question over here? Any question? Oh, we figured it out. Well, give me, tell me what the question was. Uh, we just wanted to make sure we XOR to check that see if this bit is zero? Right. 
Ooh. So you'd XOR. So tell me why, you, why you'd use XOR. Because um, if you XOR, so let's say the bit's zero, right? Um, if you XOR with the bit mask with one bit location, you're going to get one, right? Uh huh. And if you XOR with the bit mask and uh, zero is in the bit case, then you're going to get. The, I mean, if one is, if the bit's set, if you XOR with the bit mask, you get zero. Uh huh. And if it's not, then you set the bit automatically and start the next conversion. Oh boy, yeah. That's that's a, so you get two operations for the cost of one. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. I think what I would do is to say while A D C S R A ended with one shifted by A D S C bracket, bracket, semicolon. So that's going to hang in a loop, a null loop, as long as this is true. And then fall through. So you could set that right here. And then you would not be depending, depending upon the timing of a printf. That's right. Question? I got it right? I hope. I think so. It's always dangerous to write code you haven't tested on the board. Gotten burned many times. Questions about final projects? Let's talk for three minutes about budgets. $75 budget, no money changes hands, but you have to rent stuff from me. You don't, pay, you, don't, you don't peel off the bills. This is for budgetary purposes only, right? But, but an STK 500 will cost you 15 bucks to use in a final project. Each jumper is a dollar. <laughs> All right? That's, to, you know what? All right. That is to encourage you to solder your connections. Because nothing is worse than to get into a final project demo and say, I must have a loose connection somewhere. All right? Solder your stuff. That's how I encourage you to solder it. Each jumper is a dollar. Uh, LCD is uh, five or six dollars. I forget what it is. Uh, proto board, completely built, I think is twelve dollars if it has everything on it. That's explicitly priced to be slightly less than an STK 500. That's to encourage you to build the prototype boards. There's a, I mean, I can, I can change your behavior by price structure. It's just like real life, right? And so, so uh, and there's a long list. If you go for an older CPU, if you, instead of using the Mega 644, which is $8 pop, so if you want to do some big multiprocessor, you know, five-way multiprocessor, you're not going to have the budget. If you use Mega 644s. If you go to a Mega 32, which runs at the same speed but has half the memory, it costs a dollar each. I got 150 of them. Can't give them away. Anybody want one? So, so think carefully about this. Start looking at budgetary requirements right now. Can I afford a Wi Fi transceiver? Well, maybe. But you better start thinking about it. You know, can, can I afford two Wi-Fi receivers? Well, you better get on the phone and start talking fast. Because you're going to have to convince somebody to give them to you. You may be able to do that. No. Samples do not count against your budget. Anything. So you hit Atmel. You hit Atmel for a two Mega 644s. Those are free. Not $8 each. One year, the guy called me and said, how come, how come there were request for a hundred CPUs from your school all at once. <laughs> so I explained to him, he was delighted. Uh, but he was perplexed, he was initially perplexed. Because you don't get large correlated requirements for things all from one place without some reason. Uh, so yeah, 
And now the lead time on an Atmel part is about eight weeks. Uh-oh. Better, better order today <laughs> for your free samples. Mega 644. Get it in P-dip, folks. If you get it in thin quad flat pack, neither you nor I can wire them by hand. So make sure you got the part number right. Look at, but start looking at that right now. Any other last minute question? <coughs> Pavel. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Pavel's got homework one for his section. Friday group. Friday group.